everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presentation, Understanding the New DOL and IC Gig Economy Guidance. Now, independent contractor versus employee classification remains a hot topic in HR and employment law. <clears throat> Excuse me, and with it, an incredible amount of risk for employers who don't get it right. Now, before we start today's presentation, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Kimball Norup, the CEO of Compliance HR, and I'd like to express a sincere thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us on this important discussion. In addition to leading a great team, one of the biggest highlights of my role is participating in thought leadership events like this, along with our colleagues and legal experts from Littler. Now, for anyone not familiar with us, Compliance HR is a partnership between two innovative organizations. Our solutions are powered by NEOTA's AI technology and the legal expertise of Littler. Now, and our purpose as a company is to simplify the complexity of employment law and help our clients become proactive instead of reactive with their compliance strategy. For those of you who aren't clients yet, Compliance HR has a variety of solutions designed with employment law content from Littler to assist both HR and legal practitioners with important topics like creating compliant handbook policies, answering vital wage and hour, paid leave, and other labor law challenges, and also expert systems to evaluate common risks like IC classification and overtime. Now, I'm guessing most of you signed up for this webinar because your organization either already engages independent contractors or you're contemplating doing so in the future. The reality of our current labor market is that it is very difficult to avoid using ICs. <laughs> and with that comes substantial business and financial risk if you don't evaluate and classify them correctly. Now, this is a fast moving topic, as you'll hear from our speakers today. Uh, with a lot of federal, state, and local agencies who really care about proper worker classification. And unfortunately for employers, most of them have a strong bias that every worker should be an employee. The complexity and risk involved with worker classification is why we created Navigator IC. This expert system provides a risk assessment based upon a questionnaire sent to the contact, contract manager and the contractor, which are then evaluated against the toughest applicable legal tests. This powerful tool was first created by Littler and Compliance HR over six years ago and continues to evolve with new regulatory updates. There are more than 1,900 court decisions and DOL opinion letters that power its logic. Now, you may be wondering, how do I get my hands on this solution? We'd love to offer you a personalized demo of our, all, all our solutions, and for those interested, a complimentary free trial. Now, it's super easy to register uh, for a Compliance HR demo. All you have to do is submit your response uh, to a polling question that we're going to pop up now. So, Donna, if you would. And then we'll follow up and schedule uh, with you from there. Alternatively, there's a hyperlink URL in the links panel of your webinar interface. Or if you prefer assistance with your demo registration, simply include your email and best phone number in the chat Q&A box. And finally, if none of those work for you, you can always just send an email to demo at compliance HR. Um, now, while we wait for the poll to close, I want to assure you that the demo is not a sales pitch. One of our Compliance expert, experts will meet with you to understand your organization's uh, compliance challenge and strategy and walk through any areas of opportunity. And if we can help you with our solutions, we'll recommend those best suited for your needs. Okay. Now I'm assuming that I'm not seeing the client uh, or the poll close, but I'm assuming the poll's closed. So now it's time for our main attraction. It's my great honor to introduce you to today's presenters. First up, we have Neil Alexander. Neil is a shareholder at Littler and co-chair of their staffing, independent contractor, and contingent worker practice group. He also serves on the board of directors. Next, we have Josh Waltman. Josh is also a shareholder at Littler. He represents and counsels employers in litigation and administrative matters, 
including contingent workers and independent contractors, FMLA, ADA, wage and hour, and much more. Now, independent contractor classification has been a hot topic in employment law for years, but today this topic seems more relevant and important than ever before. So Neil and Josh, thank you for joining us today and sharing your expertise. And I will now pass it over to you to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Kimball. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting us today. So I'm Neil Alexander, and uh, as Kimball said, uh, co-chair of the Staffing Independent Contractor Contingent Worker Practice Group. And Josh is a core member of our group. We're both in Phoenix, Arizona, um, where uh, it's it's a wonderful season now. <laughs> 75 degrees and sunny, so uh, we're we're uh, we're happy to be in Phoenix today. Getting through uh, quickly on the agenda, we have a you know a short hour, but the timing of this is based on some new Department of Labor guidance that's, that came out, and so we're going to discuss that today. Uh, our practice group has been particularly busy with last Thursday, October 13th, the DUL issued new guidance. We'll go through some of the history of that uh, today, where we're at, discuss specifically the legal tests that uh, have been uh, provided in the new DLL guidance from, uh, that was just put in the Federal Register. And we'll just talk about big picture on U.S. labor shortage, the independent contractor issues, types of contingent workers, common misclassifications, joint employment claims, and risk mitigation strategies. Our, uh, our practice group counsels with uh, clients on the you know, specific issues of the contingent workforce, uh, legal risk, mitigating the risk, uh, assessing uh, where you can take on more risk and exceptions, and, and of course litigation when these things come up, either from uh, regulators or from uh, plaintiff's counsel. So let's dive right into the uh, new DOL guidance. So this is reflective of the changing in the administrations, uh, the presidential administrations over the last several years. Uh, there was a uh, totality of the circumstances test, is what they call it, for federal uh, uh, FLSA, Federal Labor Standards Act, which is the law that governs an employee's right to receive minimum wage and overtime. Minimum wage is less of a factor usually in, in the uh, things that come our way, the disputes, it's usually Overtime, right? Whatever compensation method that you're paying the worker, are they entitled to overtime for over 40 hours in a week? Are they entitled to overtime in some states for over eight hours in a day? And uh, there can be other uh, state law uh, penalties and, and uh, fines that are available. So uh, a parting gift for businesses under the Trump administration was tightening of the circumstances, narrowing the circumstances, when uh, there would be a misclassification determination. They basically uh, came out with a regulation um, just before the election of 2020, uh, became effective in January 2021, and to make it easier to qualify as an independent contractor, really by focusing on the control, the, the, the individual level of control on the day-to-day -day tasks performed by the workers, and, uh, and and I'm simplifying it, and we'll go through it a bit. But that 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 was uh, where the uh, Department of Labor was in this guidance, telling courts that they should focus their attention in determining whether an, uh, someone was properly classified as an independent contractor. Well, after it was scheduled to become uh, official guidance, the Biden when Biden was. Uh, uh, sworn in as a president that one of the first things they did in March was try of 2021, try to delay and withdraw the Trump regulation. Uh, March, less than a week later, a, a, a federal district court in Texas held the Biden maneuver was unlawful and said that this has already been published in the register, there's already been a 45-day comment period, and it's uh, too, too little too late to try to withdraw it. And this is official guidance that's out there, and employers are entitled to rely on it. And that was March of 2021. Rather than fighting that court decision, the Department of Labor uh, leadership under, under the Biden administration has just decided to propose a new rule and essentially um, back to the future, <laughs> trying to go back to the legal 
standards and the scrutiny for independent contractor misclassification that we saw under the Obama administration. There's a few little wrinkles that we'll go through uh, as we go through the factors, but pretty much uh, it's the <coughs> same the same test. We have been telling clients for years, I mean, remember, the only thing that's governed is minimum wage and overtime. And they're, they're you know, unlike harassment, discrimination, retaliation, uh, different, different statutes that apply, different rules as to whether someone should be deemed an employee and entitled to those statutory rights. They uh, always uh, had a pretty broad test when you're talking about ensuring somebody gets at least minimum wage and overtime. And so it's the, it's the most aggressive of the tests and the hardest to qualify for for proper independent contractor status. So the pro proposed rule, we're going to go through the, each of the elements, but it's a broad definition of employee. They're just adopting the statutory language directly from the FLSA, which was enacted in the 1930s. Suffers, permits, or otherwise employs to work. If you have a, a, an employee, a worker, who you suffer, permit, or otherwise um, employ to work, they're, they're your employee, not an independent contractor. The real focus is economically dependent, and this is an interesting aspect. You know, when we talk about are they economically dependent, we've always historically looked at it and said, is this a part-time gig? Is, you know, do they have other, other uh, sources of income? And because of the gig economy, one of the things in the 200-page new regulation, it's 184 actually, <laughs> the 184-page regulation is that doesn't mean the amount of income. So they're, they're really setting it up so that gig economy, people taking um, odd jobs, part-time work on apps, even if it's not a large source of their income, they could still be deemed an employee. They said the focus should not be on the amount of money received, but, uh, it, but you know, it's one of multiple factors. But and then, then they're going to look at, con at control and uh, ex other some of the other factors. But you, you look at it, the common sense is: Are you economically dependent or not? Are you working full time um, for for this company in, in your role? Then you're more likely than that, that you're going to be an employee, not an independent contractor. But with the way the gig economy is working, um, the new proposed rule is trying to make clear that. That even if it's not a, you're a sole source of income, you still could qualify to be an employee. And they're really focusing on in business for themselves. If I had to, to narrow it down to one phrase under the proposed new rule that's the most important, it's this one, in business for themselves. The Department of Labor says we need to evaluate the work being done and are they acting like a small business? They're always you know, going to be pro-small business, but are they acting like they're in business for themselves? What can they control? Do they, do they actually operate like a small business? And that's going to be a deep dive, obviously, into multiple, multiple factors. So the timing, the proposed rule was issued last Thursday, uh, October 13th, published in the Federal Register. There's a 45-day comment period and that's going to be come effective uh, and can be relied upon by the courts and employers in interpreting whether there's been a misclassification on November 28, 2022. We're going to go through each of the six factors that the under the totality of the circumstances test and Josh and I are going to trade back and forth of the proposed rule but here they are. It's opportunity for profit or loss investment in the business, the permanence of the relationship, the control exercised over the worker, whether it's integral to the business, not integrated, which is under the Trump administration, meaning, meaning can you subcontract it out, and the skill necessary to perform the job. And so I'll dive into number one, opportunity for profit or loss depending on managerial skill. And the factor according to the DOL that they want courts to apply is if the worker applies uh, the managerial skill in an effective way, do they have an opportunity by managing their time, managing the business, managing coworkers' time, leveraging technology, what, what kind of opportunities do they have to determine the economic 
success or failure of the engagement. Is this just a predetermined uh, rate of pay based on commission, piece rate, do they have an opportunity to negotiate it as a take it or leave it? Um, can they accept or decline individual jobs? Many application-based uh, job opportunities, that's a big, a big point that they emphasize is you don't have to do a, you know, a minimum. This is not a scheduled shift. You can accept or decline jobs at your option on your schedule. And that's a factor determining proper IC classification. Determining the order and time in which jobs are performed. Do they, this is what we talk about, are they acting like a business? Does this worker engage in marketing, advertising, other efforts to secure work? How are they acting like a business? Um, uh, or are they just going to a job site looking for, looking for opportunities? Are they acting like a business? Can they... They purchase materials and equipment and rent space. And, and uh, we'll talk about it. I don't want to get ahead of, of investment, but uh, purchasing materials and equipment, you know, buying a, uh, a cell phone to do the work is not going to be enough. All right, and I'll turn it over to Josh, who's going to talk about factor two. Thanks, Neil. So continuing with our six factors, uh, the second factor is the investment by the worker and the employer. The uh, focus here is on whether the worker's investment is, uh, quote, capital and entrepreneurial in nature. So we're all familiar with the fact that an investment in, say, tools and equipment in many independent contractor tests is uh, one of the factors uh, that goes into the independent contractor classification. Um, this particular proposed rule Really, um, factor two is one of the places where there's actually quite a bit of nuance in the proposed rule and the examples that are given in the proposed rule. So while we all might check this off as a familiar factor, investment by the worker and the employer, um, there, there are some details to dig into here, and they, they center around whether it's capital and entrepreneurial in nature. Um, this is actually, you know, Neil laid out how there was a totality of the circumstances test and then the Trump administration moved away from that to a to focus on two factors with some backup factors. And the Biden administration, although it stumbled, it has come back to return to the totality of the circumstances test. When the Trump administration introduced their uh, their rule, um, this is one of the factors that got absorbed into a different factor. So I wouldn't say it went away, but it was not a standalone factor. And in the new proposed rule that we're looking at today that was just issued last week, the DOL makes it, um, it, it abundantly clear that they are returning this to a standalone factor and that they're going to focus on not only whether there's an investment by the worker, but its relative uh, weight of that investment compared to the employer's investment and whether it's capital or entrepreneurial uh, in nature. And so uh, to determine if it's capital or entrepreneurial in nature, they want to know that it's, say, an investment that expands your market, that it's an investment that allows you to perform more work and gain uh, more business, that it's an investment that expands the reach of you being in business for yourself. The, the, where this is sort of interesting is that they have some examples that say a worker simply buying tools is not going to satisfy factor two, uh, which is a little bit different than we've seen this factor play out in other agencies and other tests. Um, so they give an example that if a, a worker already owns a vehicle, that they're not really going to consider that as checking the box on factor two as an investment by the worker. I think, I think most of us instinctually would say, oh good, that's a it's a good example of investing investment by the worker. They're saying, no, this person already owns the vehicle. They're not investing in their own business. They're not expanding their market reach. They're not uh, uh, kind of reaching more customers. And so, um, and so that, that's a kind of surprising example. Um, they, they also give the example of a graphic designer who provides design services uh, for a commercial design firm. The firm provides the software, the computer, the office space, and all the equipment and supplies for the worker. Um, the, the, the firm invests um, in marketing and finding clients and maintains a central office to manage services. The worker occasionally uses their own preferred drafting tools for certain jobs. In this scenario, 
This is a relatively minor investment and it is not capital in nature. And so this factor would weigh in favor of an employee uh, status. Um, by contrast, that graphic designer spends money uh, to market their services. Um, they purchase their own design software, computer drafting tools, and rent, that rent their own office. That is capital in nature because it allows the worker to do more work for more people and extend their market reach. So um, look, factor two, um, it's not brand new to us, but it is a little bit of a twist on what we typically see for that, for that factor. Uh, factor three is the degree of permanence of the work relationship. Uh, and we should all be familiar with this one in a variety of tests as well. If the uh, work is indefinite, if the work is continuous in nature, then that favors the employee status. If it is for a finite duration, um, if it's not exclusive and they are working for multiple people at uh, multiple entities at the same time, providing similar independent contractor services, Again, all of these factors sort of feed back to that broad overview that Neil gave at the beginning of whether they're in business for themselves. So if they're, if they're not exclusive, if they're project-based, or if it's sporadic, these are going to uh, favor the independent contractor status. And we are happy to talk a little bit more about term limits um, if there are questions that come up. But as you can see, the degree of permanence of the work relationship Term limits definitely play a role in this factor three, but as you can see on your screen, it's not the only component of this factor three. Um, and so um, we're happy to, to talk through with our clients the pros and cons of certain term limits and the business challenges to dealing with those. Um, but it all, this factor three, uh, again, goes back to whether this person's in business for themselves. Neil, I'll let you take it for factor four here. Right. So uh, factor four is nature and degree of control and uh, both actual and reserved control. And so they're, they're putting that in similar to what uh, the NLRB uh, has is if you've got controls reserved in your contract, even if you don't exercise them, if you've got a heavy hand in uh, through quality assurance, um, a pretty heavy hand on control, uh, in your in your contract, I'll look at that too. Even if it's uh, not at in practice, this is the the this you know one of the what we think is the core the, the core test, right? This this is the IRS test, the twenty factor test on, on on control, and the kind of kind of the common law test, and it's just one of the six that are considered. But it's really uh, the simplest way to say it is this is the staff augmentation. Are you treating this worker the same way you do your direct employees? Are they doing the same work as your direct employees? Do they have a supervisor uh, providing direct day-to-day -day, um, work instruction? Uh, that, that's, uh, that's, that's the way that this is uh, really most closely evaluated. Working specific schedules, uh, control over, you know, uh, performance, pay, pricing, li uh, limiting ability to work for others, marketing services or products provided by uh, the worker. Are they, you know, doing their own thing? There are some of the examples. But really this is common law control. And, you know, are and I, I just call it staff odd. Are, are you treating this worker identically or very similar to how you're treating other employees, direct employees at work? Are they doing the same job? And one of the things that we always tell clients on a consultation, and it would be provided through the uh, software, of course, through Compliance HR. Uh, I forgot to mention, I was one of the beta testers. So <laughs> I came in and we went through and we were beta testing the IC and, and the database, the secret sauce in the, um, in the, uh, as it goes through the algorithm. But they, you know, one of the, you know, it's not a bright line test, but it's it's, it's a, a general good rule of thumb. If you have direct W-2 employees performing the same job as this IC, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be red flagged. And it's one of the first questions state regulators will ask is, do you have employees performing the same job? Because they're going to assume that you manage them both in the same manner, and that's uh, and that's problematic. Josh, factor five. Yeah, so factor five is whether the work performed 
it is an integral part of the employer's business. Um, and this is a little bit similar to the ABC test um, where the, there's the core business factor. Um, this is another factor that the 2021 rule by the Trump administration varied quite a bit from the current rule in that the, the 2021 rule under the Trump administration moved away from whether it was an integral part, the work was an integral part of the business and focused more on the extent of such integration, such that somebody who was very much at the core of the business, but very sporadic, uh, maybe could pass this factor as an independent contractor under the old, uh, the, the Trump rule, which actually is a technical matter, is the rule in place at this moment as we speak while the proposed rule is pending. Uh, the new rule, though, emphatically goes back to the way it was, back to the start, um, and says, look, we're really interested in the work performed uh, and whether that was primary to the employer's business. Um, and it focuses more on the work and not on the individual. Uh, it gets back to the whether it's a critical, necessary, or central to the employer's principal business. And so certainly under the, the, the 2021 rule, uh, the extent of the integration was the focus and expressly downplayed whether it was integral to the business's services that it offers. Uh, certainly, the extent of integration remains relevant in the new proposed rule, but we've returned to what we traditionally think of as uh, whether this is integral to the, uh, the employer's business. In other words, is this really what they do uh, if it's a teacher at a school, if it's a lawyer at a law firm, if it's a you know plumber at a a plumbing company, an electrician and an electric company, these are the sorts of uh, it, people that are performing work that is the exact type of work that business holds out to the public. Um, and so uh, we're familiar with this factor. We're back to where we were um, at the start on this factor. Um, and, you know, it, it's important to see that these are the types of factors that we see it as maybe factor five in the DOL proposed rule, but also, you know, uh, factor B and the ABC test. And so you can, we're going to talk at the second half of this, this webinar um, about how to reduce risk in, in light of this new rule, but it's going to fit nicely with, um, with some of the other rules that you have to face in other contexts. So that's factor five, integral part of the employer's business. Neil, I'll turn it over to you for factor six. Yeah, but well, I'm going to do one more comment on factor five. Um, Kate Woodward asked, will you please talk about why the totality of the circumstances is less employer friendly? It's this factor is the reason why, Kate. Uh, the, this is a big part of the change between the two tests. And this is similar to, the, like Josh said, the core business factor in the ABC test. And so the simplest way to describe it is under the integral test versus integrated test, which sounds the same, right? But under the integral test, um, it does not allow you to outsource properly, uh, outsource core business functions. If you, and as Josh said, if you're uh, a tutorial company, your tutors have to be employees, not ICs. If you're a house painting company, even if you're an app saying you're, you're a matchmaking, you're, you, you're, you're providers of the service providers of what you're advertising your services to be, Whatever they are, your service providers have to be employees. You're, it does it does it does not allow you to outsource properly outsource to ICs core business functions or central functions, and that was different under the Trump administration because it, it de-emphasized this this B part or uh, of the you know the the business part of integral and, and used the term integrated. Meaning, um, you know, do we totally outsource? Do we do we totally outsource? Can you, you know, say we don't have any house painters? We're just a house painting matchmaking company, which would have been proper uh, a proper IC classification under the Trump regs, but it's not under under this one. And so, uh, moving on to, to factor six, skill and initiative, it's just high, how highly skilled, how trained um, are these. Uh, you know, electricians and others who are who are you know, have worked in the skilled trades to learn a craft for years and years. Um, we talked about 
uh, you know, uh, graphic designers and, 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 you know, makeup artists and, you know, whatever it is, just skill and initiative. It's, it's, uh, and do they use their skills in a business-like way? And uh, do they need training from the employer? Would they show up to do their job? Or do they already show up um, with a highly unique skill set that um, can be, you know, a, a software, a unique software skill set, a unique uh, code writing, uh, a unique, um, uh, a unique uh, experience on working with business machinery or whatever it, it might be, uh, public relations. You know, things like that. It's just it's a unique skill set that you don't have um, among your workforce, really, is what Factor 6 is about. Okay, so those are our six tests, and uh, Josh is going to now launch into the proposed rule. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And I'm starting to go through some of the really great questions that we have. We'll get to as many as we can, uh, but feel free to reach out to Neil and I as well. Our emails are at the beginning of this uh, PowerPoint, and you can find them on littler.com as well. There's lots of really, really great questions on here that really are just getting right to the point. Um, back to factor six, uh, one phrase I've used is high, high talent, high choice, right? Um, so on factor six, that's a phrase you can keep in your mind, is high talent, high choice. So somebody who's very uh, in demand with a specialized skill has a lot of choice of who they want to hold their services out, and that's going to play well on factor six for an IC classification. This is really a summary of, the, um, of um, some of the factors here. Um, there's, there's six factors. It's a totality of the circumstances. Keep in mind, no one factor is dispositive. So I, I saw, I couldn't quite get a written response. I saw a question, does this impact the ABC test in California? No, this is a different test by the federal, the, the DOL. Uh, the ABC test in California is it's a state test for the state law. Uh, ABC test is also used in Massachusetts and a couple other jurisdictions. So, you know, you're, you're fighting this battle on multiple planes, but the factors kind of tend to repeat themselves. This is a six-factor totality of the circumstances test. No one factor is dispositive, and that distinguishes it from the modified ABC test in California because there you have to be three for three and fulfill all three factors, and if you miss just one, you're done. Um, the weight depends, I thought this was an interesting comment, and the regulations, the weight depends on a particular case. So we just went through the six factors for you, and we've told you that no one factor is dispositive. I think it's really interesting that the DOL says in writing, the weight depends, can depend on the particular case. So if you've got kind of a factor that's, eh, you know, mildly this way or mildly that way, that's going to be outweighed by a factor that's just really strong on one side or the other. Um, and when we get into some of our risk mitigation tips, uh, we can't always solve all the problems, but this is a good example of putting in the work, getting your best practices in place, eliminating high-risk engagements um, can really help lower your risk. Uh, also interesting that additional factors are allowed. So they go to great lengths. We've got, you know, a, a lengthy proposed rule, um, and I've got it pulled up side by side on my screen here, and it's um, got a lot of detail, uh, but even with how detailed this uh, proposed rule is, there can be additional factors uh, that that are considered by the DOL when they are analyzing your IC classification. So this really um, is the second starts the second part of our presentation here. We wanted to give you what you came for first, which is the new DOL guidance. But what we'd like to do next is put this in the big picture. This is important. You signed up for this webinar for a reason. Neil and I and our practice group have been studying this for a reason. We've been um, picking apart nuances for a reason because it has an impact on your legal risk. But we want to tell you, look, the sky is not falling, and every one of the six factors that we just went through are factors that you've seen before in independent contractor matters. And so I'm not trying to say that all tests are the same or that all states weigh the factors the same or all federal agencies do, but I do want to say, look, the sky is not falling and we've dealt with these uh, before and let us walk you through sort of how this is playing out with our clients who are calling us for help. So our clients are calling us for help because they're having trouble recruiting and retaining talent right now. And so one of the solutions, certainly not the only solution, is to bring in contingent workers, whether it be through a staffing firm, through independent contractors, which you may call 
ICs, you may call consultants, you may call freelancers, but staffing firms, independent contractors um, are one way to sort of uh, get some of your work done if you're having trouble um, recruiting and, and retaining staff. And so we're just seeing a lot of our clients um, increase their use of contingent workers, which as Neil said, if you're doing staff augmentation, having people, contingent workers do work in place of or side by side with your employees is a very high risk uh, engagement and we wanna help you lower that risk as much as we can. Uh, one reason for the staffing, uh, the labor shortage is that we're sort of in an age of disruption. Um, we all went home in 2020, uh, work from home, uh, there's the great resignation, we've got supply chain disruptions, we've got uh, a big shift in how employees and employers uh, work together. Um, the digital transformation was accelerated um, and you know, you've got the wandering workers. And so at the end of the day, you just have less sort of ability to attract and retain traditional W-2 employees who work for you full time. Um, and, and that's why a lot of folks are using contingent workers uh, more and more. Um, part of this is that there's just so much employee choice, and we've seen it tick down just a tad, but it's still at a very high level. For every uh, worker who's looking for a job right now, there's 1.67 jobs out there. It reached as high as a two-to-one ratio uh, earlier this year. And so there's just a lot of choice, and that goes with the flexibility that your workers want. It goes with the choice that they have um, and is playing a role in our independent contractor practice. Um, the ghosting trend um, is also contributing to the labor shortage where employers are ghosting employees who apply for positions uh, and employees likewise will get an offer uh, and ghost an employer um, and just sort of contributing to the to the labor shortage. Um, all, the, we, we, we have uh, one survey here, but they all are showing the same things, which is a large percentage um, of of people who are not freelancing are saying, well, I would consider that uh, in the future. And so a lot of talent is just sort of available in different places. Um, you've got a lot of uh, companies saying, look, uh, the labor force is shrunk and we are using contingent workers easily 10 times what we were uh, pre-COVID. So this is sort of across a lot of industries um, and, um, and we'll go through sort of the types of contingent workers here for you. Um, so that we can put this DOL rule into context and then move on to some of our risk mitigation tips. Neil? Yeah. Um, and working our way to some of the questions, uh, hard to uh, ask, does this test also apply to situations where an employer is assigned contingent workers through a staffing agency, co-employment, or pure 1099 independent contractor issues? What this test asks is, uh, under the DOL, is this your employee for purposes of minimum wage and overtime? Um, it's less of an issue if it's through a staffing agency who's paying that worker on a W-2 because presumably they're already paying minimum wage. They're already uh, paying overtime. So the test is the same, but the, 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 the damages, the potential damages kind of go away. I mean, if you're if you're going through a staffing agency, but a big part of that, uh, Hardeb is, is saying, are they paying the worker on a W-2? One of our risk management um, requirements is that you require your providers uh, to, to to pay the talent if we think it's a high risk engagement. You require them to pay the talent um, on a W-2 basis. So they're 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 payrolling that worker. They're paying them on a W-2 basis. Well, then it's, it's kind of not, not relevant anymore, as long as they're doing the, uh, the minimum wage and the overtime correctly. So, you know, that's, that's a huge part of our risk mitigation assessment when we come in and evaluate your contingent worker programs in total is, okay, are you making sure? Don't just assume, you know, large, uh, large staffing firms are going to pay their workers on a W-2 basis. That's just the way, the way they are. But if you're using smaller mom and pops in different, um, you know, different parts of the country, particularly where, like, for recruiting purposes, it's, it's tougher, You're, you'd be surprised that uh, if you don't require it and don't check on it, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that they're actually paying that way. Independent contractors as freelancers as 1099, employer of record uh, is where 
you find the employer of record is where the company finds the talent and they ask somebody else to, to pay with them to pay them on a on a w-2 basis so it's not your company it's not your you paying the worker directly they paid on a w-2 it's different from staffing in that employer of record typically is uh, the end user client is the one who has found the talent. You're not paying an upgrade, a markup, uh, because they're not doing the recruiting and the, the sourcing for you. Professional employer organization, PEO, really kind of beyond the scope to, to go into too much detail, but a PEO doesn't find the talent either. They are a co-employer, intentionally a contractual co-employer, because they provide all of the benefits and HR services uh, for your workforce, but uh, you find your own your own workers, and so that's that's their value proposition is compliance and uh, and providing a good benefits package to your to your employees. Master service provider MSP is a separate third party administrator that manages your staffing and independent contractors. Josh, you're going to go through the common misclassification and joint employment claims. Absolutely, thank you. And so here, here's where you get in trouble, right? So, okay, we went through the new test. We referenced the fact that there's lots of tests out there, which you knew coming into this, but we, we've gone to the DOL test. We've sort of told you that the, the, the companies are using more and more contingent workers. We've told you the types of contingent workers and services that are most common. So where do we get in trouble as an employer who's trying to engage independent contracts, uh, contractors? Well, the most common types of claims are the workers' comp, unemployment, wage and hour, and tax. Those are not the only types of claims. Let me start with workers' comp and unemployment. They're generally, not always, generally one-off claims. Uh, sometimes they get bigger, and, and we can talk about that uh, if you want to contact us, but the, they're generally one-off claims for relatively lower dollar amounts. Um, but when you respond by, to workers' comp and unemployment claims by saying, that's not my employee, that's a contractor, it may trigger an audit to, by the agency to say, oh, well, how many contractors do you have? And we'd like to see a roster of those. And so, and so now your single unemployment claim, the agency who's investigating it, is asking to see a roster and you've got 150 independent contractors that you don't exactly want the agency to be scrutinizing and to be sharing information with other agencies who may have an interest in scrutinizing that as well. The agencies um, have a need for revenue streams and I'm not saying that's the only reason the agencies are doing this, they're tasked with enforcing this, but they consider independent contractor misclassification claims a source of the revenue, and in fact, there's actually um, budgets that budget in certain amounts of recovery for misclassification claims. And so workers' comp and unemployment, I call them the gateway claims because they're relatively small by themselves but can lead to bigger problems. So wage and hour claims um, are the biggest, the class action wage and hour claims are the biggest exposure generally speaking, that, you, that you'll face on misclassification claims. The way, that, the way this works is, and this is particularly relevant to today because we're talking Department of Labor, enforces FLSA, wage and hour. You've also got state labor codes. Um, if you're in uh, California, you've got meal and rest breaks, extensive pay stub requirements. Um, even in states like Arizona, you've got sick leave requirements. Um, and um, I was just responding to an, a question on the chat a uh, $7 million misclassification verdict um, uh, regarding nurses recently within the last couple months. And you might say, okay, guess which state that's in? It's not California. That was a Virginia case. So this by no means is isolated to California. Um, but today we're talking about DOL, um, enforces federal wage and hour laws. And what happens is, let's say you've got 15 um, tech, IT, independent contractors. And you've said, well, there's an exemption under the FLSA called computer professionals, so they probably fall under that. Um, and you know what, these folks, we're not gonna hire these folks, they're independent contractors, they offer their services to us, and we're not gonna retain them on a W-2 basis. We're going to engage them as ICs, and even if we're wrong, they're exempt from overtime because they fall under that 
uh, computer professionals exemption? Well, you don't renew one or more of them. They get really mad. They go to the um, DOL and the, or the state agency who refers it to the DOL, and then they're they're investigating and they say, hey, um, this independent contractor says they were they should have been your employee, and and by the way, they say they work 60 hours a week. That 20 hours of overtime a week at time and a half at a pretty good salary for an, uh, for an IT uh, professional. Um, and so we're going to use that DOL test that Neil and I just went through with the six factors to determine if you indeed misclassified them. And if we lose that test, then we're looking at 20 plus hours of overtime each week, time and a half for however long you engage them for the last 12 months, 18 months. And they will get interested in the others who are similarly situated. So not just that individual, but the other 14 that you had engaged. And so that's how, you know, the slide is common sources of liability. That's how you get yourself in hot water with a misclassification claim. Um, now you go, let's say you lose at step one that, the, that uh, on your independent contractor classification and you, and you lose that part um, and it is an uphill battle um, and you lose step one, so the, you should have been classified as an employee. Now, there, now you're at step two of what are the damages, and you're saying, well, look, these guys, these folks didn't work the hours a week. They worked 40, at the most maybe 41, 42, but they worked 40 hours a week. Um, you don't have any pay records for these, for these workers. Uh, so to go back and to prove exactly when they worked is quite a task about figuring out when people log in, and uh, it's hard to come back and combat that. So common source of liability, wage and hour is a big one. Uh, class actions can be very large and it can be expensive to defend. Um, unpaid taxes is another big source of liability. So talk about um, agencies who view this as a source of revenue. The IRS comes in and says, hey, you've been paying this person on a 1099. You should have been withholding and remitting taxes for this person. You should have been paying your employer portion of the tax for this person. You should have been, by the way, the IRS enforces the ACA, you should have been providing Affordable Care Act coverage for this person. So it's another big bucket of liability, both state and federal uh, unpaid taxes. Uh, EEOC, uh, we, Neil and I get these all the time, um, whether we're representing the, the client or the staffing firm, so the host or the staffing firm, they often get both, both get named in the EEOC charge. And uh, Neil will talk about mitigating risk here in a minute, but one of the ways we like to mitigate risk is to make sure there's a requirement to report to each other if you get a claim of harassment or discrimination. Because what Neil and I deal with sometimes is we have a staffing firm or a host that says, I never heard of this claim, and now I've got an EEOC charge. We never had the opportunity to investigate and remedy the problem. Um, OSHA, as another uh, source of liability, OSHA actually takes a unique approach. They have something called the Temporary Worker Initiative, and they say when it comes to staffing agencies and hosts that you're just jointly and severally liable for safety um, for the workers. Uh, so OSHA pr goes pretty far down the road by saying, look, we're just deciding that when it comes to worker safety, you're both liable. The NLRI keeps flipping back and forth on their test. Um, uh, uh, Neil had mentioned it before, and I won't go into detail now, but, uh, you know, union organizing uh, has a bit of momentum, uh, and what can happen is co independent contractors or staffing firm workers can, can join in those union organizing campaigns saying, hey, we're actually employees and we should be able to, uh, to join this. Uh, benefits is, is another big bucket of common sources of liability. Affordable Care Act coverage, not only for the individual claim, but for the group claim, if you're using a large contingent worker population, meaning staffing firms, independent contractors, or some combination, and that exceeds 5% of your workforce, so compare that to your W-2 employees, it exceeds 5% of your workforce. Well, if you're found to have misclassified those contingent workers, uh, and they should have been your employees, and you never offered them ACA coverage, you're at risk of falling below the ACA's requirement uh, that you offer 95% of your employees Affordable Care Act coverage, uh, 401k, stock purchase plans, um, things that contingent workers can pop up, raise their hand and say, hey, 
uh, actually, I should have been your employee and been allowed to participate in those. Um, so these are some of the common sources of liability. Um, the penalties, just some examples up here. Um, you know, the, the more labor code that a state has, the more ways there are for you to be hit with a penalty, um, you know, for a misclassification. Hey, this person should have been your employee, and now you're facing these uh, non-compliance issues because you weren't paying attention to that because you thought they were a contingent worker. Um, but it's not just California. You've seen a few other examples up here. Um, Washington just passed a, a law about independent contractor uh, uh, agreements that have to have a right to report language and carries a $12,000 fine per independent contractor if you don't include that in your IC agreement. So if you haven't updated your IC agreements in the last three to six months um, and you do operate in 50 states, um, it's a good idea just to have a quick wellness check with us. We can insert the most recent language and keep you compliant. Neil will take us home with some uh, tips on how to mitigate risk. Yeah, so obviously our uh, host today, uh, Compliance HR, have a tool that, that they've developed uh, that is precisely on this issue. It's a check the box uh, options as you go through. It's if you, you know, already know, you gotta be honest as you answer the question, obviously, right? So I, I've gone through and I helped beta test it, but if you go through and, and it's, you know, are you exercising control the same as uh, other employees? If you answer no, but in reality you're doing it, it's, it's only as good as the information you, you feed into the system, of course, right? So it's a, it's a great step to go through and perhaps for procurement professionals, HR professionals uh, who knew that it might be a risky engagement, it also provides you with kind of internal political backing to say, hey, we've got this risk assessment tool and it's showing um, that it's a concern. But one of the really nice things about the compliance HR tool is not only does it give you a grade of, of risk, a heat gauge, you know, from green to red, it also provides some of the reasons why. And it might be in the state of engagement, well, they're you're not providing any tools or they're, they're, you're, you're paying the person on their social security number rather than a different FEIN that only costs, you know, $15 online to have your workers, your independent contractors, requiring them to go out and get a separate FEIN so you're not paying them on a social security number. So um, the, obviously a compliance HR tool is a great way, it's a great self-service tool. If you've got a bigger program and you want a, um, a bigger evaluation of the big picture, how are we doing with risk management? We do audits in our in our group. And so we'll come in and it's everything from uh, a couple of quick calls, uh, in, you know, and uh, about the program and reviewing, reviewing redlining your policy and a couple quick calls at the very low end compared to a comprehensive audit where we're evaluating 50 or 100 different classifications of independent contractors in multiple states uh, and creating an executive report and PowerPoint for, for, for C-suite and, uh, and justification for where we see risk areas and where you can eliminate it, like a very comprehensive uh, audit. So that's, you want to look at your policies, you want to look at your contracts uh, uh, in the contingent worker space, and you want to audit your practices. A, a very quick self-audit uh, self audit is to go through, and, and I always ask, how many contingent workers do you have? Where, 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 are your, where are your providers coming from? And if you don't have a third-party administrator, an MSP, just start with uh, uh, accounts payable and get a list of all, everybody you're paying on an accounts payable basis that's not a direct employee, figure out who those companies are. Are they recurring payments? What are the scope of services? Is this staff augmentation? And just get your arms around it that way uh, you can follow the money and figure out where those folks uh, where those folks are at. Uh, moving along quickly through this, we've talked about the red flags, but you know, longer durations. If you're scheduling them, if you're treating them as staff log, um, engaging somebody as both an IC and an employee. If you issue a 1099 and a W-2 in the same year to a worker, it often will automatically. If there's a large 1099 and a large W-2 it will automatically trigger uh, in the IRS system an audit for that individual worker. 
IC is doing the same work as an employee. Um, how extensive is the training, the equipment, reimbursement, no business formalities. Uh, these are all, all things that, uh, uh, that are looked at carefully um, when uh, evaluating if there's been a misclassification. You know, we want to look at uh, staffing firm agreements. Um, you know, if, what's your staffing firms? Are you requiring that they pay the workers on a W-2 basis in the agreement? And if it's a, a really small company, you know, maybe you audit that they're actually issuing those W-2s. Um, are they performing the HR functions? Are you managing the relationship with the staffing firm and not the individual employees? Indemnification is great. It's wonderful. For the topic we're talking about today, by the way, indemnification, insurance, it's not covered by insurance. If they're unpaid taxes, unpaid overtime, um, it is not insurable. They may pay for the defense fees, but they're not going to pay for your settlement uh, with the right kind of insurance. It's just they're not. So it's dollar for dollar out of your pocket. And if your staffing firm provider can't afford to pay, you're going to be jointly responsible. Um, IP ownership, where work for work for hire clauses. If it's a uh, 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 staff, uh, if it's excuse me, uh, coding, work for hire, uh, art, intellectual coding. Um, if you say this is a work for hire in California, in particular, there's a particular clause that says if you have a work for hire clause in your agreement, it statutorily makes them an employee for unemployment benefit uh, purposes. We like worker acknowledgments specifically that say. I understand. I am not an employee of your company, and I'm not eligible for your benefits. And we go through, and you can put in arbitration agreements. You can put in um, requirements to report uh, to report safety issues and so forth. But these are all ways to help reduce your risk. We look for contingent worker policies, how how uh, and how you manage that within your organization. Um, who is the who is going to be the uh, gatekeeper? In your organization, to you know, rather than just frontline and departmental managers or regional managers, to make sure you're engaging people properly on an IC basis. And I know it's extra work for procurement and HR and others, but you ought to have a gatekeeper who's trying to make sure you're being consistent um, uh, across um, uh, across these types of engagements. So. Well, I know we have a last chance to register. I know we want to get to our questions before we do the last uh, last couple here. But um, uh, uh, Kimball, did you want to have a couple words, or should we do the questions first? Yeah, just real quick, if we could pop the um, the poll. Just again, if anyone's interested in a demo, just uh, raise your hand and click on the poll. Um, but otherwise, yeah, in the interest of time, I, I, we have a few minutes. Um, Neil and Josh, any any hot questions you want to get to? Uh, so, just looking back, um, you know, it's uh, I'm up to like uh, let's see, swing one. I see or project work. I'm not sure what that one's about. Let's see, is it forbidden to have IC performing activities of a core of a company? Is it forbidden um, under the ABC test, under the new DLO rule, and under uh, California AB five? It's, it, it is, I won't say it's forbidden, but it's, it's, you're, you're misclassified. You're not allowed to outsource um, the, the core functions um, or they'll likely be deemed to be uh, a misclassified employee. There's, you know, there, there's a lot of factual dispute in that, but that's the, that's the hardest part and the biggest distinction is, is uh, this, the difference between the rules of the, of the two administrations and the difference uh, with AB5 is it's really tough to outsource. Josh, did you want to pick up a question? Yeah, so if you have, we're going to that uh, line of questioning, there's another question. If you have direct W2 employees performing the same jobs as contractors, we will get red flag. Can you explain more on this? So really what this goes to is if you've got employees and contingent workers, whether it be staffing firm or ICs, doing the same work, that means that your contingent workers, people you are calling not your W-2 employees, are doing the same work as your W-2 employees, that is a very strong, one of the strongest indications that they're a part of your core business, you're exerting control uh, over them. It goes to several of the factors that they're not, that the individual is not in business for themselves. Instead, they're part helping you with your, they're, you're in business for yourself. Um, so, um, you know, that's one of the biggest factors. When we have the call 
with you, whether it's the initial one hour call or it's the full, you know, two month audit of your contingent workforce group. One of the key questions is, are you, do you have any contingent workers doing the same work as your W-2 employees? Because if you do, it just tilts all of those factors toward, hey, you should really be treating these folks as employees. Uh, Neil, I see that we're at time. I have put our contact information on the screen for everybody, Neil and I. If you want to copy us both, we're very happy uh, to talk to you about these uh, issues. If you want to um, have a consult or talk about what our audit services or revising your contracts can do, uh, very help, help, happy to help you understand the new rule and to help you mitigate that risk. So um, thank you to everybody uh, for attending and please reach out with any questions and thanks to the folks at Compliance HR for having us. Perfect. Well, the, folks, that uh, wraps up another great webinar. Our sincere thanks to the, the, our thought leaders from Littler, uh, Neil Alexander and Josh Waltman. Please do reach out to them, um, their contact information, if you have any questions directly to them. And obviously, if we can be of service here at Compliance HR, we're happy to talk with anybody. And a huge thank you to all of you for attending the presentation today. We hope you all have a wonderful day. And that concludes our webinar.